Hello, everyone, and welcome to the, an overview of cerebral visual impairment, what it is, and considerations regarding evaluation and management. When I agreed to do this lecture, it became an exercise in, well, what do I, what do I present? Where is everybody on this topic? And I um, reached out to colleagues from around the world and asked for their ideas regarding uh, what should be included in this lecture. And I, I tried to whittle down and distill as much as I could every, all the feedback that I received and put together something that I hope, regardless of what your level of knowledge is with CVI, there's something you can take away from this lecture. And I hope those of you that um, have more to share um, are able to do so in a venue like this going forward. My thoughts today are to cover uh, some issues around brain development and pediatric brain damage, what the C in CVI means, cortical, cerebral, complex, or should it not be anything at all? Should it be brain-based vision impairment? Um, talk a little bit about how your approach to patient care is different than that with um, typical patients. And then um, a few slides on starting a clinic and then several slides on resources needed within your setting in the community and resources for yourself regarding additional knowledge on cerebral visual impairment. So to get started, we have a, a polling question right here. And if you could just respond to that. Okay, so it appears that the vast, well, two thirds of you are, are in a major city within a tertiary care center or have resources to that. And over th about three quarters of you are either in a medium or major sized city. And then, so we have really both ends of, a, of a, almost a bell shaped curve here. We have one group in a rural setting and a much larger group in an urban setting. Okay, that's important to understand. All right, and then uh, this polling question here, how comfortable are you in making a diagnosis of cerebral visual impairment? Okay, so the majority of you are either very comfortable or comfortable making the diagnosis and a little bit less than half are not comfortable. All right, so even those who are comfortable, it'd be interesting to see over the course of the presentation and by the end, whether or not your sense of what CVI is or is not is changed. Let's begin with pediatric brain damage. So it's brain damage rather than brain injury as we see in adults, in adults or teens. Uh, they're, well, the brains are fully developed, the pathways are, are very much uh, laid out, whereas in a developing brain, quite the opposite is the case. And so we talk about brain damage versus brain injury. And we'll see here on this slide, here's the, the first trimester, second trimester of brain development, and here the third trimester of brain development. Note what the brain looks like at the beginning of the third trimester and look at, as it appears in a newborn. So there's a lot going on and a lot that can happen in the neonatal intensive care unit rather than in the mother's womb. From 24 weeks to term, each cortical neuron, um, it's estimated, establishes 1,000 synaptic connections. And you can see in this picture here, the white matter uh, will increase by fourfold and the surface area with all the undulations will increase by eightfold. And synapse formation and myelination occurs from 24 weeks through four years of age. Um, and it includes cellular proliferation period as well as critical periods of brain development and modulation. All right, well, encephalopathy is a term that's used for any diffuse disease of the brain that can alter function or structure, right? So encephalopathy can be caused by many factors 
in infectious agents, metabolic or mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, brain tumor, increased pressure in the skull from a variety of factors, prolonged exposure to toxic elements, chronic progressive trauma, poor nutrition, or a lack of oxygen to the brain. Any of these things um, can lead to brain damage and um, cerebral visual impairment, among other things. So there are various terms that are used to describe the brain damage at that time. So one term is encephalopathy of prematurity or white matter damage of immaturity, both of which include PVL, periventricular leukomalacia, which is in effect the, uh, the, the linings of the ventricles, um, of the white matter linings of the ventricles become damaged as a result to encephalopathy. Uh, due to immature um, immune response, immature vascularization, um, and, and therefore an inability to deal with any sort of inflammatory issue. It could also include uh, encephalopathy of prematurity, da damage to the thalamus, basal ganglia, brainstem, and cerebellum, as, as well as reduced growth and development of the posterior corpus callosum and its connections. So here we see the white matter, ventricles, and the gray matter, and associated with um, brain damage of the premature infant would include cerebral palsy, gross and fine motor issues, poor adaptive functioning, perhaps a lower intelligence quotient, some potentially behavioral and emotional problems, uh, visual pathway abnormalities that we're certainly all familiar with, retinopathy or prematurity, myopia, strabismus, but also cortical or cerebral visual impairment. And of course, in the preemies, uh, you know, asthma from, a, from the developing uh, lung. Brain injury at full term is a little different. The uh, connections are a little tighter. The blood vessels are a bit more developed. The uh, immune response or the inf dealing with inflammation is, is a bit more uh, nuanced. However, it's still somewhat immature and there can still be some areas of the brain as a result of encephalopathy that can become damaged. And at the full term, it impacts gray and white matter. It can be more diffuse than uh, PVL. And there also, uh, like in the preterm, there can be problems with motor control, cognition, emotions, learning, and can result again with cerebral visual impairment. So the main causes of cerebral visual impairment are really dependent upon maternal health complications during pregnancy, of which it could be anything that can cause inflammation to the brain of the developing fetus, including trauma, anoxia, epoxy infection, seizures in, in the neonate, uh, genetic situations that can impact biochemical pathways in the brain, and some that do not but can impact the functioning of the brain, and abnormal development without an identifiable cause. So another polling question. Which of the following examples have you suspicious for a possible diagnosis of cerebral visual impairment? Check all that may apply. Okay, so with decreasing, well, not until the last one is there a significant. So everyone pretty much agrees that, that the first patient has CVI. About half of you on the second two examples. On the last example, about a third of you um, agree that that patient might have CVI. Let's see what happens um, as the presentation continues. And I, I I just want to again thank everyone for attending this presentation either at the beginning of your clinic day or for many of you perhaps at the very end of a long clinic day. And I appreciate your 
you're listening and watching this uh, at this time. So, as most of you know, cerebral visual impairment is the number one cause of pediatric vision impairment in the developed world. There's a tremendous variation with either uh, many misdiagnosed or not diagnosed at all. And I have an example of that later in the presentation. Uh, that is someone who made it through late teens without being diagnosed, even though it was under active eye care. Individual born prematurity with sig significant visual, motor, intellectual, and other issues, right? Uh, three quarters of you felt that that patient does in fact have CVI, many with very reduced acuity contrast and an inferior field defect, or they can be very much higher functioning. For example, someone who uh, cannot read well without excessive enlargement, and excessive meaning even though they have good acuity, they, it, the, the letters are too close together and too little space between each word for them to make sense out of it and need enlargement in order to accomplish that or masking or other techniques. They cannot cross the street or recognize familiar people by sight. In other words, visually guided motor planning is difficult and or understanding movement in the visual world is extremely complex, too complex for them and difficult to process. Uh, also, there could be some, some uh, some disconnection between temporal and spatial processing, that is hearing and vision, although that will not be discussed much further in today's presentation. It is present in a very significant number of individuals with cerebral palsy and other comorbidities, which is why um, Dr. Elzordibus, Dr. Fazi, uh, two, two well-published uh, neurologists on the topic of cerebral visual impairment um, have contributed so much to the literature in the cerebral palsy clinics that they run. So what's the C in CVI? Well, where did it even come from? Uh, about a century ago, around World War I, soldiers were surviving gunshot wounds to the brain, and they had various uh, issues with their vision as a result of a gunshot to the back, to their occipital cortex and surrounding areas. And so it was termed cortical blindness with the basic understanding of essentially good eyes, bad brain, or bad visual brain. And that term uh, is the term and code that we still use today to code for cortical or cerebral visual impairment because there is no diagnosis code for CVI. Cortical visual impairment then became uh, a commonly used term, at least here in the United States, uh, back late 80s into the 90s, uh, as a result of, you know, with the, with the hope that vision that starts out extremely poorly can in fact develop and improve. And obviously if it improves within the first year of life, then the appropriate diagnosis would be delayed visual maturation. If it doesn't improve within the first year of life or after the first year of life, then uh, perhaps the most appropriate term would be cortical or cerebral visual impairment. One could argue that. In fact, uh, unlike 20 years ago where delayed visual maturation was a term that extended well beyond the first year of age, I think more and more eye care practitioners are comfortable diagnosing the uh, unexplained vision impairment from the, from the uh, LGN forward or the chiasm forward as cortical or cerebral visual impairment rather than delayed visual maturation. I believe it's a more active diagnosis and would uh, expedite care um, for that birth to three child with appropriate trained people to maximize uh, the visual development of that child. APOS, the American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmologists, uh, changed their definition in 2015 of what CVI is they call it cortical visual impairment. It, they say it's a decreased visual response due to, neurologic, due to a neurologic problem affecting the visual part of the brain. Typically, a child with CVI has a normal eye exam or has an eye condition that cannot account for abnormal visual behavior. And they go on to reiterate that it's the, one of the most frequent causes of vision impairment in children. So here for the first time, uh, uh, an eye care group acknowledges the fact that, in, that you can have uh, not only uh, issues 
in the anterior part of the visual pathway, but also in the posterior part of the visual pathway. But the issues at the anterior portion of the visual pathway do not adequately explain how they're using the vision they have. I'd like to call your attention to the, to the definition at the bottom, the functional definition. Vision impairment due to damage or disorder of the visual pathways and visual centers in the brain, including the pathways serving visual perception, cognition, and visual guidance of movement. This was a definition that was put forth by Gordon Dutton, an esteemed pediatric ophthalmologist, and Amanda Lewick, an esteemed vision educator, and both, both of whom have lectured nationally and internationally. Uh, they uh, published a book in 2015 called Impairment of Vision Due to Damage to the Brain, uh, in Vision in the Brain. Uh, it is a, an excellent book uh, for those looking for additional information on all aspects of the identification of individuals with CVI, as well as p possible habilitation strategies and the logic for them. And this is a wonderful definition in that it is not structurally based, it is completely functionally based. It allows and understands that MRIs are not available everywhere in the world for a diagnosis. It also understands that structure doesn't always equal function. In spite of having a potentially normal uh, MRI of, of the typically ones typically obtained, it still does not mean that there isn't an issue with function. And that brings up the concept of vision function versus functional vision. Uh, Gus Kohlenbrander in Dutton and Bax's book uh, on CVI uh, talked about this concept. And so vision function, quite simply, is any of the data that you collect as part of an eye exam. Acuity, contrast, intraocular pressure, numbers. Functional vision is how they use what they have. And in fact, that's often the chief complaint from the parents or the caregivers or the actively involved educators with these children. It's like, how do they use what they have? Or, you know, I don't understand that the acuity is pretty good, but yet Johnny can't read or doesn't understand the letters. I don't understand what's going on. So Dr. Kohlenbrander would say that in your exam room is not a place to measure vision, fun uh, rather, sorry, function. it's not a place to measure functional vision because you're not looking and observing the child in their, in their typical environment. However, I feel it's critical that we try to approximate or we use what we can in the exam room to get a sense of their functional vision so that we can, we can best advocate for their needs and write in our reports recommendations surrounding what we found in our environmental modifications in the exam room and how that impacted performance. For example, if I'm collecting uh, teller card grading acuity on a patient, and I can do that in a busy exam room with my interns walking around, having a conversation with the parent, and going card after card and getting to a comprehensive threshold, that tells me one thing. If on the other hand, I need to have the room visually and auditorily quiet um, and just highlight the, the cards themselves, and there's significant latency for the child to be attracted to that card that I might need to use um, some auditory stimulus like tapping on the center of the card to gain their, their visual attention to the task by using auditory stimuli that are proximal to the task. And then how sustained is their fixation? How many cards can I go through before they need to take a break? All of that becomes important when trying to determine uh, some idea about how that child might use vision in a classroom, whether it's significantly adapted for them or not. Other vision function findings that we need to collect, obviously, are acuity and contrast. The two do not always go together, and um, I think it's critical that we do collect contrast on our patients as well as acuity findings. And of course, uh, with periventricular leukomalacia and many other, well, with periventricular leukomalacia, you really have to be concerned about an inferior field defect, whether it's uh, relative or absolute or whether it's a quadrant or complete. Uh, and others with, with brain damage, depending upon the areas of the brain that are impacted, that impact the visual fibers coursing back from the eye to the occipital cortex, there could be associated um, field deficits. And of course, we need to distinguish that from visual neglect. 
Uh, finally, one other piece to look at is the optic nerve. And here there's been great debate and much change over time. Uh, looking at an optic nerve, if you saw a large cup and a pale nerve, you would automatically in a newborn, one of the things to be thinking about is, does the child have glaucoma? Another thing to add to your differential here is the possibility of retrograde axonal degeneration that occurs uh, from the LGN forward as a result to uh, brain damage uh, more further back in the visual system. It's a brain lesion that occurs between the 24th and 35th gestational uh, week and that is before the optic nerve is fully developed. And uh, Dr. Jacobson feels very strongly that rather than termite atrophy, which it looks like for all of us who are used to looking at adult nerves that were once completely healthy and then become atrophic, she feels it should be termed optic nerve hypoplasia as it has not been fully formed and therefore is not appropriate to call it atrophic. Believe it or not, I've had parents come into my office and say, my three-year-old, one doctor says atrophy, one doctor says hypoplasia. What is it? I don't understand the difference. So it sounds like I'm making a small, uh, this is a, a, a subtle point, but I think it's an important point. And we as an eye care profession probably need to get on the same page about this to provide less confusion for our patients and their families. And of course, there are higher order uh, visual uh, processing issues that can impact children with uh, who have cerebral visual impairment. In fact, this may be the, the significant area that's impacted rather than acuity or contrast or color. Uh, and here you see, uh, many of you might be familiar with the Dutton picture on the left of, of the various centers of the occipital cortex and the uh, temporal lobe and the parietal cortex for the dorsal stream. Uh, posterior temporal lobe um, for the ventral stream and the connections to the midbrain and the frontal lobe. Uh, here, this, uh, this speaker um, then had these color, came up with this color coded uh, system here, which matches the boxes in this screen to provide some additional information for the viewer uh, trying to understand this slide. Dr. Dutton instead created a tree of vision for parents and anyone to uh, consider regarding the areas of the brain that can be impacted with um, cerebral visual impairment. So here we have the ocular structures going back, the nerves, the chiasm, the tracts, subcortical vision, LGN, and then the occipital lobes, and here branching upwards for the dorsal and ventral stream. And you can see the components that are involved in the dorsal stream, vision for action, and you can see this white area here where there's some overlap of responsibility between the visual library of the brain, the temporal lobes, which are involved in naming colors, recognizing words, letters, numbers, um, objects, shapes, animals, recognizing people, facial expressions, finding people in a, within a group, right? So you can see there are some shared areas of responsibility and some relatively separate ones. Um, it's believed that more and more people have the dorsal stream impairment than have ventral stream impairment. Uh, uh, but we'll sh give a, show you a case where perhaps that there are times where we might be underestimating that. As I mentioned before, delayed visual maturation is really appropriately defined when, at, when within the first year of life, uh, visual function returns to normal. It almost seems that you can't make that diagnosis until the vision has improved, right? So, so I think that goes towards why I am more likely to give a diagnosis of CVI rather than delayed visual impairment. And perhaps after year one, if not only uh, vision function, but functional vision has improved dramatically, would I consider then reclassifying it as, as um, delayed visual maturation? So we'll have a, a section here now on what we think about as we, as we see a patient who might have CVI. And I think this is the most challenging, one of the more challenging aspects of this is, and makes it so much more interesting and exciting than routine eye exams. Here we need to collect a, a, a significant amount of information about the child, analyze it, and not trying to be too 
visual system oriented in our views, but still, is there, is, are there some underlying visual reasons, visual pathway reasons, uh, regardless of where that lies, anterior or posterior visual pathway, are there some reasons that have been not diagnosed yet or understood that can be contributing to the presentation of this patient? And in fact, that is often the chief complaint by the family. How does my child use their vision? What does it mean? Where is the problem? And so we review uh, either with the patient or ahead of time, and usually some combination of both, uh, the maternal health, the birth history, the medical history, the developmental history, any CVI surveys or inventories that might have been done ahead of the appointment um, by either vision educators uh, using their uh, assessment tool that's one of the assessment tools that are commonly used um, in, in, in North America, as well as reviewing reports from all the players that you see here on the list on the right. All of them are important. They all have something to offer. Uh, the neuropsych reports, go, you know, looking at overall intellectual functioning, looking at the difference between performance and verbal, looking at the visual perceptual tests that are done and understanding and uh, trying to figure out, well, why is it poor? If it's not poor, why wasn't it poor? Were they using other skills to accomplish that task? How do I explain all of this? And how do I probe during the exam in order to get answers to these questions? Or who else can I bring in to help us understand how this child is using what they have. Often other issues that the parents might express is how can we improve the use of vision for things like activities of daily living, communication, learning, or other aspects? What should the print size or symbol size be? Right? So knowing their acuity, you want to go a little larger than that, just like we don't read 2020 text, we read text that's closer to 2050. Um, the salient features of their symbols need to be uh, a few times larger than threshold as well. How many symbols do I fit on a screen or uh, in, their, in, their, in their notebook, in their, in their symbol notebook? Uh, should there be contrast between them? How close should they be next to each other? Well, you know, if there's a lot of, if the child has issues around complexity, then simplifying the symbols and putting fewer on a, on a page probably is the best way to go. I have here a picture of a, of a toddler looking at himself in a mirror to remind me that we do in fact use a mirror, a, a portable mirror, a small mirror in our office, uh, maybe you know, 30 centimeters square or a little larger, where, where the, we, I would hold it up and look and see if that patient is in fact, uh, recognizes him or herself in the mirror. Do they get a smile? Do they reach out and point to the person? Can I use it and move it slowly and, and see if the child is able to um, follow themselves or sustain visual attention? Or do they only sustain it when it is still? Or and how long do they sustain it? If those are things I might look at with a mirror. I find surveys helpful as part of a history tool, not as a diagnostic tool. There is not one uh, author of a survey that suggests in any way, shape, or form that the survey is the be all and end all to a diagnosis of CVI. It is part of doing a structured history. And in fact, Gordon Dutton's survey, he finds uh, from his approximately 50 questions, there are five that appear to be most salient for him when he interviews families. And the next slide will enumerate those. Dr. Ortebis in her surveys also suggests this very strongly. And if you go to the teachcvi.net site screening tools subpage, you will see that there are three surveys there for various developmental ages, each of increasing number of questions. And um, they, they again point out quite clearly, she and her colleagues, that these are used for referral um, and not for identification and not for diagnostic purposes. Uh, the Israeli survey is a wonderful survey uh, for individuals who are, um, who have, are low functionally, are functionally developedly very delayed. And it's a, it's a wonderful survey for them. Short and easy to give. Here are the directed history questions. And there may be some here that depending upon uh, the culture, and the, ch the child's uh, understanding of the environment that may need to be adjusted appropriately, but 
uh, these, these five questions uh, resonate most strongly in the work that Dr. Dutton has done. And um, we often ask questions similar to these uh, during our history taking as well. All right, so you've collected a bunch of information during the history. You've, ahead of the patient, reviewed perhaps lots of reports. And, and now it's like, okay, now the rubber meets the road here. How do I, how do I manage this patient? Well, many of you are familiar with working with kids and, and infants, and many of you are probably also familiar with working with kids with multiple impairments. However, in my experience, I, I see that there needs to be there needs to be an adjustment for how we think about the exam. I often see reports where it says untestable and uncooperative. And I don't think that that's an appropriate uh, onus to place on the patient. Uh, we are in a sense the host for that patient for this exam, just like you're a host at a dinner party or a party you're having with friends and family. And your job as the host is to make sure everyone has a good time. Your job as the doctor is to provide the environment through which you can collect the information that you need in a, in a way that the patient feels comfortable and therefore you can be successful. As a caveat to that, it's not only how one introduces and importantly models and adapts the technique and, and modeling it with a, a loved one and enlisting their help for how to model it so that you can be successful, but also when one performs the technique during the exam that will ultimately determine your success in acquiring that information. Succinctly, it's performing the right test at the right time and the right way. The exam doesn't have to begin with covering the right eye and read the lowest line of letters you can see. In fact, if you're gonna start with acuity at all, it's always with both eyes open first, not one eye or the other. And you might do motilities from a distance first and slowly approach the child with a toy of interest um, and gain their their comfort as you approach their, their personal space. We are strong believers in collecting any form of data we can, both functionally and uh, so vision function and functional vision data. And so we do collect acuity. I know there are some who feel that grading card or, um, uh, or lay, using layer paddles are not appropriate ways to assess vision function. Uh, we disagree, we understand and explain to our parents that this is uh, a detection task and not necessarily a recognition task, and it might overestimate uh, traditional letter or symbol acuity, but it gives us some function, significant functional information and it gives us numbers to compare over time as we're watching the development of that child. Uh, we do not have the time to go through how to explain to use the cards, uh, but just be aware that at good light there are instructions and um, some videos that you can either get at the good light site or search online. Uh, Dr. Hervonanen with her paddles is loath to report an actual acuity and prefers cycles per degree as a recording of, of the acuity. We, t we record the cycles per degree in our chart and in parentheses put the uh, an acuity notation that is more understandable by the general public. And again, with the caveat in our report that it might be in some cases significantly, but in most cases, slightly overestimating Snellen or symbol acuity. So the cards are labeled or the paddles are labeled in cycles per centimeter, but keep in mind, so that's the physical measurement of the card, regardless of where you hold it versus here, where this would be cycles per degree. If the card were further away, then you see that, that the angular subtense of it is different and it then is what could be translated uh, to an actual acuity measure. And you can see, as we all know, that acuity develops pretty rapidly um, over the, the first year or so of life and then even the first year and a half to two years of life and then starts the plateau and here uh, are Leia's norms for, uh, for acuity. The uh, teller card acuities that are also available have their own sets of norms, both with both eyes open and monocularly. I say both eyes open rather than binocularly because many of our patients are pretty educated and most of our patients do have a strabismus, so binocular acuity doesn't resonate with them. I've had more than one parent say to me, 
what do you mean binocular acuity? My, my child has this large eye term, whether they say ESO or exotropia, they're not, they're not binocular. So to, we know as eye doctors that that's shorthand for both eyes open, but they don't. And rather than get into that conversation, I've just become accustomed to saying, even with my interns and residents, both eyes open. Of course, we all assess the impact of occlusion on a patient. And as well, we should be paying attention to the order of occlusion. You know, what's their behavior like? So, you know, there's the standard measurements of central steady maintains fixation. Um, and then, but how do they react to that patch? And how do they, you know, if the better eye, obviously, or the better seeing eye is being patched, are, are there more behavior problems than when the other eye is patched? And what does that mean? And if there's a subtle difference, is it, the, is it that there's a, maybe an amblyopia or is it that was, was the test order? And perhaps then the next time you see the child, you switch the order of which eye you patch first. You also need to be creative when you assess this population. <clears throat> and that goes from having some appropriate toys that are gonna engage patients, be looking at hand-eye coordination, visually guided motor stuff with things like form board puzzles of which you can include the layer puzzle, both the black and white side and the color side as part. And, and look at here how it's very simplified, very simple colors, lots of space between, and there's actually an image of, of each of these shapes below. Compare that with this here where there's these animals, farm animals, and if you don't look, if you, on a quick look, you don't even see the outline of where those shapes fit in. So if you have varying levels of complexity of puzzles, you can assess how, how, that, potent, how that child might be operating uh, in their near space and perhaps even what, how they deal with complexity out in the world beyond. This is sort of a down and dirty way of confirming some things that were noted perhaps in the visual perceptual testing that was done as part of the neuropsych exam or, or the school-based uh, assessments. All right, Leia also has uh, contrast cards that are a nice screening set. She also has a device to assess visual fields. Uh, we use a, a different device that's homemade that, that are wands, that we have two wands that are similar so we use it like a confrontation. So we're holding both of them, but only illuminating one at a time and try to assess a field. We also need to look at the impact of a correction of refractive error. You know, some might say that if you have acuity of, uh, example, uh, 2,500 and you find plus two as the refraction, should you prescribe it? You know, it doesn't make sense. The acuity doesn't match, and that's even out of their, say, their better seeing eye. The acuity doesn't match their function. On one hand, why bother? On the other hand, um, you know, maybe providing that little bit of impetus, providing some of that focusing for that patient can then stimulate at least some increased visualization, visual attention at near that then could grow on itself. And it might be that the patient doesn't need glasses for, uh, for the rest of their lives, but it could be something to help stimulate visual attention. And one way of assessing that is through the use of dynamic retinoscopy, uh, which we really don't have time to go into. And, uh, uh, but it's something that, that is underutilized in this population and should be considered. Uh, Dr. Lawrence and her colleagues, a uh, clinic that she works with, uh, had, had done a, has a case series of patients who very definitely benefited uh, from the use of plus it near to stimulate uh, the use of visual attention and accommodation. My only caveat for using dynamic retinoscopy with this population, even though some of your uh, diagnostic kits came with MEM cards, uh, monocular estimate method cards for, that have even pediatric uh, appropriate shapes on them. Uh, even though we think they are appropriate for a given patient, they might not be. So you might want to consider using something that's clinically revel relevant rather than maybe something that's scientifically prudent. So even a somewhat large toy of interest held in the relative plane of the, of the retinoscope as you're using to assess an accommodative response, whether they're significant width or not, or they're accommodating right to the target, in which case you would see a nice bright reflex. Uh, 
But if, if there's a significant lag, even with a toy of attention, then I would very strongly consider the use of an ad or uh, their, their underlying hyperopic correction in order to uh, generate some sort of positive uh, utilization of their vision. So after you collect all the data, uh, you need to, and, and so the hard numbers, vision function plus functional vision findings, you need to sort of roll that back in your brain, think about everything that that child came to you with, with their reports, and figure out if there are places where you can plug in or even come up with a diagnosis uh, to explain what's going on. So you, it could be as simple as making an environmental accommodations, pre prescribing spectacles, either prescribing some low vision devices, depending upon the age of the child, or some pre-low vision devices uh, in a way to get them used to things, uh, or even uh, just enlarging print or symbol size, providing key things, uh, issues around complexity, uh, advocating for vision professionals to be involved in the uh, vision educators to be involved in the care of that child. Or it could be a referral to an educational team for further evaluation and with a strong emphasis on making sure that that child feels part of the educational community and the community at large. Um, it's not that they, you know, yes, they don't see the world the same way everyone else does. And the goal of the accommodations, whether it be glasses or low vision devices or enlarged print, is to level the playing field, to make it so that they too can um, um, participate in learning um, the, same, uh, the same way as their fully sighted peers or as close to possible as that is, as close as possible to that goal. We might be seeing someone who's transitioning from early intervention, the birth to three programs, to preschool. And, and with that patient, potentially, when I discussed having to turn off the lights and just wait a significant amount of time for, for them to make a visual response, that's someone who's going to need a visually quiet and auditorily quiet room or area to engage vision, if that's, in fact, the goal of that particular task at that time. And certainly, they'll need frequent visual breaks. We also are seeing people who are transitioning from one school to another, or people who are increasingly mobile and being able to do it on a, it can't do it independently when on an age appropriate level they should be. We also might be seeing someone who's nonverbal and has a sense of cause and effect. And so we may need to be making recommendations regarding uh, how they should use their vision for their particular communication system. However, whether it's computer-based auditory output partner assisted with auditory output or, or symbols and whether or not those should be simple symbols, colored symbols, what kind of background, et cetera. All right, so here's a case of a preschooler, two and a half years old, with periventricular leukomalacia, cerebral palsy, and they came in for an assessment of acuity and visual field. This patient walks with his head down and the question is, are they walking with their head down because it's cerebral palsy or is there a problem with vision? He was premature. PVL, periventricular leukomalacia, was diagnosed via ultrasound. Uh, his type of CP is spastic triplegia. He has healthy eyes with an intermittent uh, right exotropia. And here you see his grading card acuity, which is reduced. Uh, here are the monocular norms and you can see it's below. It's there, you know, very, very low side of normal in the better seeing eye, and at least the card below that in the, in the right eye. Our colleague, Dr. Mayer, uh, developed a, a bold perimeter, and I know that there's a, a bold perimeter, more of a tent-like structure that's being developed at uh, LV Prasad in um, Hyderabad, and that shows some promise and hopefully will become um, uh, more available, will become available, become commercially available in the near future, but it's, that's an awesome device. But this is a one of a kind device at this point. And we used, Dr. Merrick uh, attempted to collect field information on this child. You can see that's sort of free space and she sees the patient's face in her monitor and she can present the stimuli wherever. And there's some reinforcement for the child to fixate. And then uh, some lights are presented anywhere in the periphery and she assesses whether or not the child sees it either by the eye movement or the head movement towards or pointing towards those stripes upon which there's a positive reward given additional flickering lights in that area plus some music. Here you can see on the field though, importantly, you can see that there is an inferior field defect 
as a result of PVL. So the reason why this child uh, walks with his head down is, is to, in fact, see the world in front of him. Uh, and when we collected acuity, we also needed to have just the cards illuminated. So even though those numbers are what they are, functionally, they're probably much lower. Also, when he went to reach for something, he kind of looked away before grasping, a classic sign of, <clears throat> of, of an issue with visually guided motor behavior. And all of these, along with the PVL and the history, uh, are strong indications that this child has, in fact, cerebral visual impairment. I mean, sorry, has yeah, cerebral visual impairment and needs proper recommendations and support in the school system. At the other extreme, here's a school-aged female about to graduate from high school who was born prematurely, had retinopathy of prematurity, and comes to us from several states away wondering about vision function versus functional vision. So how much vision centrally and peripherally does she have is the question, and how does she use her vision? She has difficulty walking with changes in terrain or with steps. She has a slow reaction time, and they're wondering about a second opinion about her proficiency for driving. Her eyes ache and tire easily with demanding near tasks. The eye doctor, who had seen her in the past, previously over many years, uh, felt that her vi visual acuity and visual fields <clears throat> were adequate excuse me, were adequate for schoolwork <clears throat> and driving. Prior vision teacher and orientation mobility specialist evaluations felt that services were not needed for her. In fact, um, she was told she was lazy by both her eye doctor and when, she, when the mother would go to team meetings about this, that was reiterated to her as well. They just felt that uh, this patient was using her acuity as an excuse for not performing. And when I mean not performing, she was still a, a BA student, getting good grades, but worked really hard to do so. I met her, she was sitting uh, in the uh, waiting area, and we had a short conversation, and she was very verbal, very articulate, very engaging, completely right on. She and her mother, we went into the exam room, we had the history, uh, and here you see Again, premature twin to twin transfusion syndrome. She had bilateral germinal matrix hemorrhages, um, irregular uh, shaped brain, and hypo hy hypotonia of her trunk and extremities. Her ocular history was positive for retinitis, retinopathy of prematurity. She had very high myopia and anisometropia, which and a staphyloma, which was in was more was more pronounced in the right eye, and she also had some refractive and strabismic amblyopia in that eye. So anyway, we had this wonderful conversation, and then we, we went to collect acuity. And it took easily 15 minutes to collect acuity with both eyes open and with each eye separately. And as it went on, her voice became fainter, her skin became paler, and she literally went from sitting erect and comfortably in the chair to almost twisting and curling up onto her side and turning her head to see the, the screen at the far end of the room. Everything changed about her. This was fatiguing uh, and clearly was not an act. Here is a bright person. You would have not expected this at all. This is something beyond the anterior visual pathway. Here's here are her fields that were done by the ophthalmologist, the red here or the outer circle for, the, for those who might be color deficient is the normal field anticipated or an approximation of it. And the circle inside is what was found on with the one eye softer assessment of, of her gross extent of her visual field. A neuropsych eval uh, revealed normal IQ, uh, normal IQ uh, but there were processing speed delays and anxiety. A driving evaluation uh, was, was felt that she was unable to manage and figure out what to do in a complex situation. And in a driving simulator, even had great difficulty planning and successfully completing a lane change. 
to quote the uh, findings of the driving evaluation, she currently does not have the life skills necessary to cross a busy street, manage herself independently at home or in the community. All right, this is an occupational therapist performing this evaluation of driving and came to the succinct conclusion that she cannot safely cross the street or be independent. Um, and here she is about ready to go off to college and hopefully get a driver's license. Uh, and at the same time, well, previously, the, the vision educators and the eye doctor taking care of her uh, didn't really consider what else might be going on. So there was a, a recent MRI that was done that was requested, but in real time, I also had the mother and daughter independently complete a Dutton survey. Here we see the MRI findings that are positive for mild parietal and occipital area volume loss and asymmetric ventricles. So the Dutton survey says <clears throat> not applicable, not, not applicable um, rarely, often, or well, rarely, sometimes, often, always are the bins uh, that you could select or you tick off as you move down and answer each item. And there are categories of, of things that are assessed. And there are a series of questions regarding visual field and visual attention, uh, a series of questions, uh, 11 of them on visually guided movements. There are five questions on impaired perception of movement, et cetera, as you can see. And mother and the patient scored always or often on 26 of the, vors of the dorsal stream items. On the ventral stream, uh, mother and daughter disagreed on six of seven. That is, the patient reported an inability to recognize close relatives in real life and in photos and confuses strangers for familiar people. Yet she was able to hide that from her mother uh, her entire life, right? She's, she's very social, she smiles, she says hi, and when she hears the person's voice, she can then greet them she came up with a very neat adaptive strategy. So the question I pose to you and with the patients that we see that are nonverbal, how many of them might also have a ventral stream problem that we're not able to completely diagnose because we don't have the feedback specifically from the patient? In any event, what we concluded was that she does in fact have an ocular visual impairment, if you will, and I know there are some that hate that term, so an anterior visual pathway uh, um, problem, but it's not the primary cause of the way that she's using the vision that she has. The ed team and the eye doctor unfortunately did not identify these signs consistent with cerebral visual impairment. The MRI in this case, plus the exam observations, plus the Dutton inventory, uh, revealed quite strongly that this patient has cerebral visual impairment and we provided a host of recommendations and resources and strongly advocated for their implementation to allow this person to maximize her potential uh, within her community and her life. So, you know, instead of going to a four-year school, she went to uh, a community college and we had um, vision educators working with her to make sure she had access to that environment. and. Um, and that she was able to move forward. Uh, the final couple of pieces of our presentation is to, is, to, is to look at setting up a CVI clinic and then resources. Resources uh, that might be helpful for you setting up the clinic, resources helpful for patients learning more about CVI, and resources helpful for, um, uh, for you to learn more. Fortunately, there's this wonderful article that's, that's been recently published and is available as a, uh, you can download it for free, that talks about the, uh, what they went through to set up their clinic in, in their setting and some of the pros and cons and the work yet still to be done in order to maximize their impact on children with cerebral visual impairment. And I encourage you all to look at it. Their goal was to develop a holistic approach in the clinic and in the community. Their clinic team included a pediatrician, a neurologist, a psychiatrist, an occupational therapist, a pedi ophthalmologist, an optometrist, and a pediatric orthoptist. And the issues were that they needed to develop a, a good whole a team within their own setting 
but they also needed to find and, re and develop and or recruit agencies to provide the services in the community. Importantly, they and others have pointed out the extraordinary important role parents play in the habilitation of a child with cerebral visual impairment. They must be engaged and uh, involved and whatever, is and whatever we are recommending needs to be recommended in a way that is perfectly understandable by them and in a way that they can execute, empower themselves to uh, best enable their child. Uh, so our recommend the recommendations that they provide need to be structured and achievable and of course uh, in many role settings uh, and in varying countries the equipment needs to be affordable and there needs to be an effective and constructive feedback loop. Resources. Um, I, I uh, am employed by the New England College of Optometry, uh, but our clinic is at Perkins where it's been for over 30 years. And I contacted the Perkins International Program and they got back to me with uh, some resources since they do trainings of vision educators from around the world. And here are some resources uh, that you could utilize that they then may be able to direct you to services in your area. And I imagine these slides will be available for you to uh, look at uh, on, your, on your own time as well to get this if you can't grab it right now. And then here are some other agencies uh, that through their network, they sent out a mailing and um, uh, Namita Jacobs was helpful in, in telling me about uh, one of these uh, associations one of these organizations here as well. And, um, and so here they are. So here are agencies that are up and running and not from all over the world, unfortunately, but, and this is an opportunity for futures to put together a resource list uh, where people can get services in their communities from throughout the world. And having said that, I know one site that's trying to do that and connect doctors and parents and uh, vision educators is the cviscotland.org site. It's an awesome site, a growing site. Within one year of it being up, it had been viewed in over 100 countries. Um, other uh, links that I often include in reports are the ones that follow here. And then, fi uh, then finally, uh, here are some textbook resources for cerebral visual impairment. Uh, a vision educator who lectures around the world and, and very often in North America is Christine Roman Lansky. And she uh, has a second edition of her book that was recently published. But I know that there's another book that's about to come out uh, that has even more information uh, that Perhaps, I mean, you, the first, second edition, there are, some, there are some changes, but perhaps that other book is something else that you want to uh, potentially look at. So some key points. Approach to care needs to be patient-centric and parent, parental-centric. There needs to be, there is a significant diversity of presentation of individuals with cerebral visual impairment. The presence of an anterior visual pathway condition does not rule out the possibility of CVI. Providing the diagnosis of CVI often requires a significant review of medical, educational, and eye care information. You need to learn about the resources in your country and community. If few exist, consider some combination of developing, developing them at your setting and then beyond your community, partnering if possible with agencies, regional institutional agencies for the blind, and others, seek, seeking the help of others internationally, and figure out ways of engaging parents to aid in maximizing the child's potential. All right, and here is the last um, poll question. Please check any that apply relative to this presentation.
Okay, yeah, and I, I apologize for not having more useful resources. Um, I actually spent about two months trying to collect those resources that I was able to provide for you today. Um, and that was the best I could come up with. Uh, so it's obviously a goal uh, for all of us involved in the care of these patients to work on developing those resources uh, for others, uh, for all of us around the world. Uh, finally, I'd like to uh, thank you all again for having me speak, and I hope that you all walked away with something important for you to think about. Uh, it's my knowledge came as a result of the uh, 18 years I've been at the Perkins, the New England Eye Perkins Low Vision Clinic, and working with my colleagues uh, Derek Wright, who who for the last couple of years hasn't been with us but uh, is working elsewhere. But as a vision educator, he was instrumental in really attuning me to the tremendous role they can play in, in assessment and in uh, treatment, uh, habilitation of individuals with visual impairment and other vision impairments. And Dr. Louisa Mayer, PhD, vision scientist, um, who's just a, a wonderful person and, and is brilliant and inclusive and her former experience as a special education teacher has been invaluable. And currently at Perkins, I have a colleague who's awesome, Nicole Ross, and the liaisons to our, our respective schools at Perkins who um, have taught me a lot over the years about how to work with this population. Thank you. And I do have, if it, I know I've run maybe just a speck over, I do have time for just a couple of questions. So thank you, Dr. Crane. You can go ahead and uh, stop sharing your screen. And then you can open up, we have two questions so far, if you wanna open up the Q&A box. Q&A box, there they are. Why specifically? Uh, all right, so the first question is, why specifically inferior field defect commonly occurs in CVI children? Okay, so um, when you think about where the periventricular leukomalacia is, it impacts the optic radiations. So it grabs those radiations, uh, that bundle of fibers, it can hit them bilaterally or just on one side. And if it's bilateral, you'll have a complete inferior field constriction. And if it's uh, on, on just one side, then you'll have uh, that side, that quadrant will be impaired. So it's, it's those fibers going back that's the problem. Does VEP have a role in diagnosing CVI? Huh, that's a good question. So there are, one issue is how many centers throughout the world? Well, centers might, but, but does the diagnosis of CVI need to be something that can only occur at a tertiary care center? Um, and the answer to that question is, uh, I don't think so. I think it, you know, we essentially have a primary care practice, but we see tertiary care patients. And we're often challenged by the tertiary care ophthalmologist. We're actually referred patients to make that diagnosis. So I think VEP is helpful, perhaps, in distinguishing a behavioral acuity from uh, what the brain potentially might be able to process. Uh, I know that uh, there have been several studies published regarding change in acuity and VEP over time, and there was one by uh, Fulton and colleagues that showed that they seem to change in step over time. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I think it's if you have it, great. If you don't have it, it's not the end of the world. Uh, the visual neglect from a visual field defect, I think I'm going to refer you so there was a question here, how do you differentiate visual neglect from a visual field defect? That is a very long and complicated uh, answer. And I think I'm gonna refer you to Gordon Dutton's and Amanda Lewick's book uh, for that as one way of differentiating. But as a quick answer, sometimes just moving the head and the body towards that area, all of a sudden they see it, they see a person that they didn't see there before um, should give rise to the thought that that maybe there is neglect. There are also these cancellation tests for older children who might be able to do them and where you can see, in fact, strong neglect and uh, where they'll, well, they'll miss things that they should be finding, like there's a line bisection task or searching for certain things within a piece, a piece of paper and they miss them only in one area. 
so things like that, you can differentiate a field, a normal field, yet uh, they have neglect. Uh, does vision stimulation work for CVI? Oh, well, um, I think that's a loaded term, uh, not intentionally, obviously. Visual stimulation. So there used to be a thought, you know, vision teachers used to be involved in what's called vision stim. And that's fallen out of favor, the use of that term or what they thought they were accomplishing. The, I think the broader question to ask, and I think maybe what you were trying to ask, are there ways of improving the individual's use of their vision? And the answer is yes. And I think looking at Christine Roman Lansky's book for some of her thoughts, looking at Gordon's uh, books, especially Gordon and Amanda's book, with her thoughts, I think are, with their thoughts, uh, with, and it's not just their thoughts, They've, they, in, they had people writing chapters from around the world who are uh, leading edge with respect to the care and management of individuals with cerebral visual impairment. So creating a space where they can use their vision and then slowly making those changes to perhaps adapt them to more typical settings is helpful. Giving them alternative ways to process that information using a multi-sensory approach if pertinent uh, for that person for travel and learning uh, should be employed. So tools that are currently in, the, in a vision educator's toolbox as part of a functional vision assessment, which include a learning media assessment with sensory channel component uh, is, is really helpful. Uh, to work with. Within your own clinic, uh, again, I would just, for the interest of time, I, I think Gordon and Amanda's book is a really great place to start. All right, and then finally, uh, what is the LVD that can enhance visual field defect in CVI children? I'm not sure what LVD means. Um, I know there are some, there's some work in, in Germany. Oh, low vision device. What is the low vision device that can enhance the visual field defect of CVI children? Huh, that's, that's a good question. So we had someone else with an inferior field defect who was unaware of that space below. And we tried using, for example, yoked prisms and to bring that visual world up into a seeing field. And it, did, it was not successful. And I think it was not successful because even though we brought it to his field, into his awareness, uh, we were unable to get him or the orientation mobility specialist was unable to get him to, or to integrate that information into his visual world. I think unlike um, where you think about a peli prism or other prisms to make somebody aware of their, their field deficit, you know, by bringing stuff from that field, an image of it into their seeing field, can be helpful in that it, it causes better scanning. I think that's the goal of those, of, of like a Pelly prism, is to remind the patient to look into that, that, that non-seeing field, become a better scanner. Some of our kids do become, with a field defect, become extraordinarily good scanners, which makes assessing the visual field quite difficult because now you're telling them, I don't want you to use the, the adaptation you made on your own in order to, um, for me to collect the information to define your, your visual field deficit. And there, uh, sometimes we need to advocate for actually uh, unified or, or improved scanning skills if their scanning skills are insufficient. But in terms of other low vision devices, uh, I haven't, you know, for acuity, you can certainly prescribe uh, monoculars for distance, for spotting. You can certainly prescribe uh, handheld or stand magnifiers at near. Uh, we use a lot of, we have access to a lot of electronic magnification devices. Obviously smartphones with their cameras are awesome. Uh, other ways of enlarging print. So there are a whole host. You're, you should not, you should be thinking about using your, uh, your toolbox that you use for traditional low vision patients for this patient population as well. All right. All right, so thank you, Dr. Cran. Uh, I think that's a good place to stop since there's no more questions. Yep, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. All right.